After months of researching, recording, and editing, this is the final video in my Ashita build series. Yes, the Ashita is one of the easiest Wii portables that you can build, but if you've seen the length of this video, you might have guessed that it's still an incredibly involved process. I ran into many problems during my build, but I hope that I've added enough commentary throughout the video so that your build goes smoother. If you're serious about building your own Ashita and you haven't seen the other videos in this series, you need to go watch those first before watching this video. Let's jump over to the bench and I'll show you how to assemble, configure, and use the Ashita Wii Portable. Let's start by going over all the parts that we'll need to build an Ashita. I mentioned in the intro that the Ashita is one of the easiest portable Wii's you can build because West teamed up with 4Layer Tech to produce custom PCBs that make it easier to wire everything up. 4Layer Tech also has a convenient BOM or bill of materials that lists all of the other parts that we'll need. The first section of the bomb is for all of the controller board parts. Since the Ashita is designed to look like a GameCube controller, it uses many parts from an OEM GameCube controller, including the stick boxes, the L and R slide potentiometers, the Z button switches, and most of the buttons and button membranes. I'm going to use the buttons and membranes from an old GameCube controller, but I ordered new slide potentiometers and Z button switches from the BOM. You'll have to source a second Z button as well. I ordered this one from Etsy. I'll be sourcing the stick boxes from a Wii Classic controller as they use the same stick boxes as the GameCube controller and they're cheaper to find on eBay. I noticed that the Z button switches listed in the bomb are the wrong switch. They seem to be for horizontally mounting on a PCB, but the ones we need are vertical. Thankfully, the Wii Classic controller has two of the correct Z button switches, so I harvested those as well. We also need a GC Plus 2 from 4Layer Tech, which is a custom PCB that acts as a GameCube controller emulator. We'll need to order two speakers from DigiKey, along with a flex cable and flex cable connectors in order to join the two controller PCBs to create a single emulated GameCube controller. The next section of the BOM is a little more complicated. It contains all the parts we need to populate the interface board from the Ashida custom PCBs. This board provides a mounting point for the RVL amp, another custom PCB from 4Layer Tech that handles amplifying the Wii's digital audio output. The interface board also houses the headphone jack, volume wheel, power switch, start button, and an optional Bluetooth sync button. The last section of the BOM contains all the other parts that we'll need to finish our Ashita. A 5 inch 16 by 9 IPS screen and the associated driver board, two 2170 lithium ion batteries and battery clips, our trimmed Wii from the previous video in this series, a cooling fan and two heat sinks for cooling the Wii processor and GPU, the 3D printed shell including some smaller pieces that I 3D printed on my own printer, the PMS2 that we used to test our trimmed Wii, a PMS PD from 4Layer Tech, which is a USB power delivery board for charging the lithium batteries. We'll also need the low profile SD card adapter included with the PMS PD and the custom Ashita PCB set from 4Layer Tech. And we'll need to reuse the screws from the Wii case that we disassembled. Let's talk for a minute about the resin 3D printed shell. I wanna give a big shout out to PCBWay for sending me this 3D printed shell for me to use in my Ashita build, but I wanted to talk about some of the things that you may run into when ordering a resin 3D printed shell. This is a transparent resin. This is the UTR8100 option from PCBWay, and as you can see, it's pretty clear. I'm not actually gonna be using this particular shell in my build. As you can see here, there is a giant crack in the bottom shell at the top here. Just as a reminder, be careful when you're handling these resin shells because some places are kind of thin and you obviously risk breaking it in certain parts. It's not super fragile, but still the chance is there that you can crack it like I did. I actually cracked this while I was trying to fix a warp in this first shell. You can see the top and the bottom of the case don't really line up in this particular one. I tried fixing it by heating it up in some warm water and then kind of bending it back in place and letting it cool down again to see if it would try to come back in place but it, it really never did, and then I eventually cracked it. Now, thankfully, they were able to send me a free replacement because these resin shells are not cheap, and I hope they honor that with all of their customers. I am sponsored by PCBWay, so I hope I didn't get special treatment. I really hope that they stand behind their product and will help people out if they end up getting a warped case. Now, ordering one of these cases is pretty simple. All you have to do is upload some STL files and choose the right options in the menu, but my recommendation to you is to mention in this comment field here that this is for a, an Ashita build and maybe link them to either a picture, just somewhere maybe on BitBuilt or something so that they can visualize what the final case is going to look like. That way that they know that they should send this as all one piece put together and then with some foam wrapped around it so that it will stay together and is less likely to warp. The first time they sent me the shell, the pieces were wrapped individually. So I think that is why this top piece warped because it is kind of thin. So they should ship it to you as one unit 
all wrapped with styrofoam. Other than that, I think the resin printed quality is really awesome. It is covered in a clear urethane protective kind of coating that does make it glossy like this. So I think it's a pretty awesome case if you're going to be doing an Ishida so that you can see all of your parts on the inside. Let's start by populating the controller PCBs with all of their components. First, we need to take the flex cable connector and solder it to the right controller PCB. I like to solder one of the ground pads first to secure the whole connector, then I solder the other side. Finally, I add some liquid flux, and using a J-tip on my soldering iron, I slowly drag solder across the pins in the middle. Next, let's solder the GC Plus to the right controller PCB. The GC Plus has castellated edges, which makes it easy to solder on top of the controller PCB. Start by soldering one pad on the controller PCB and the matching pad on the GC Plus. Heat the solder on the controller PCB and slowly line up the GC Plus so that all of the pads line up with the pads on the controller PCB. I soldered one more pad on one of the other sides to prevent the GC Plus from moving, then I soldered all of the remaining pads around the GC Plus to connect it to the controller PCB. This is what mine looked like when I was done. Next, let's add the R button slide potentiometer. This needs to be soldered on the same side as the GC Plus. Then we can solder the pins on the other side. Then we can add the Z button switch, but this needs to be soldered on the opposite side as the R button slide potentiometer. Then solder the pins on the other side. To finish up the right side, let's solder in the C stick box. The stick box should be installed on the side with the two white rectangles. These particular stick boxes use screws on the bottom to secure them to the PCB. Then on the same side, we can solder the pins to the PCB. Now we can follow the same process on the left controller PCB. First, solder on the flex cable connector. I accidentally bridged a bunch of the pins, so I used some solder braid to remove the solder. Then I went back over them again with some flux and more solder. Next, solder on the L slide potentiometer. Then solder in the other Z button switch. And finally, solder on the left stick box. Now let's move on to populating the interface PCB. We need to solder the RVL amp to the interface PCB the same way we did with the GC Plus. Well, I say the same way, but I soldered all the pads on a single side first before I soldered all the other pads. Next, we need to install the volume potentiometer to the interface PCB on the same side as the RVL amp. Then we can turn the PCB over and solder the pins on the other side. Then we can solder the headphone jack to the top side of the interface PCB. Solder one of the headphone jack legs to anchor it, then solder the rest of the legs to the PCB. Next, let's solder the power switch to the top side of the interface PCB and again, solder the pins on the bottom. Finally, we need to solder the start button and the optional Bluetooth sync button to the bottom of the interface board. Here's how my interface board turned out. You can see all the components are facing the same direction. Now we can start putting components into this beautiful resin shell. Because it's transparent and because I've had this shell for a while, I cleaned some of the smudges and dust out before I started. Let's start by adding the cooling fan to the shell. If you look at the arrows on the side of the fan, you'll notice that the airflow is directional. When we put the fan into the spot in the shell, the fan arrow should be pointing up. That way the fan is intaking air from the outside so that it can blow air across the heat sinks and exhaust it out the back. 
Then we can add the two heat sinks into the slot above the cooling fan. But don't remove the blue plastic yet, otherwise you're going to get dust and dirt inside of the adhesive. Next, let's add the right trigger into the shell. It's easier to install the triggers if you compress them and put the whole compressed trigger into the opening in the shell. Now, see these little black trigger brackets? Don't install these because if you do, later on the controller PCBs will hit them and not sit flush. I found this out later and had to take them out, so just don't use them and the triggers will still be fine. Now we could repeat the same process for the left trigger. At this point, you can start to get a sense of how the finished Ashita is going to feel, which is super exciting. Let's go over these lithium ion batteries for a second. Compared to AA or AAA batteries, the positive side on these batteries doesn't stick out that far from the battery. You can tell it apart from the negative side because the negative side is completely flat. When we install the batteries into the Ishida, the positive side will be facing up and the negative side will be down on both batteries. These are the battery clips. They go into a slot on either side of the battery cutouts on either side of the shell. Before we add the clips to the case, it's easier to solder wire on the outside of the case. I'm using 22 gauge silicone wire for this. I'm going to solder a red wire to one of the clips that will act as the positive side. Then I install this clip into the positive side of the right battery of the Ishida. We need to run this wire over to the left side of the Ishida through this hole underneath the heat sinks. These batteries need to be wired in parallel so that this battery clip will connect to the other positive battery clip on the left side. Let's solder the wire from the other battery clip to this battery clip outside of the case. Then we can install this battery clip on the left side of the Ishida. Now in order to connect the battery clips to the actual PMS board, we're going to solder a second positive wire to the left positive battery clip. Just leave a long length here so that we can solder it into the PMS later. Now we need to repeat the whole process for the negative battery clips. This is what everything looks like after wiring up both sets of battery clips. Now we can install the PMS2 and start wiring up the other components that connect to it. I'm going to use the silver screws from the Wii shell to secure the PMS2 to the Ashita case. I wanted to get these battery wires out of the way, so I soldered the positive and negative battery wires to the B plus and B minus pads on the PMS2. Here's what my Ashita looks like after soldering those battery wires. Next, we can solder the fan wires to the PMS. I know it's hard to see in the video, but there are F plus and F minus pads on the bottom side of the PMS. The black wire goes to the minus pad, and the red wire goes to the plus pad. Here are the fan wires soldered to the PMS. Now we can install the interface board. We need to put the two 3D printed buttons in before we screw down the interface board. I'm going to use these slightly shorter silver screws to secure the board into the shell. Next we need to wire up the power slash charging indicator LED. There are four legs. D0, plus, minus, and D1 if the LED is oriented the same way as shown here. I decided to bend the D0, plus, and D1 legs out of the way so that they don't interfere with the PMS board when we solder wires to some of the legs. Then I cut those legs short, leaving enough room to solder wires to them still. 
I used 30 gauge silicone wire for this. I used a red wire for the plus pin. Then I used a yellow wire for the data pin. I want to mention that the PMS2 wiring diagram mentions that kits bought before March 2022, which was actually after I bought my parts, should use the D0 pin to connect the data to the PMS board. I actually did that in my build, but found out later that the LED wasn't working, so I had to rewire my LED to use D1. So here you'll see me soldering the yellow wire to the D0 pin, but my recommendation is to solder that to the D1 pin instead. I also used some heat shrink tubing to protect the wires from shorts, but this is optional. Now, the LED is going to be fixed in place via the minus or ground pin. We need to pre-bend and pre-trim the minus pin to line up with the ground pad closest to the LED on the PMS2 board. Then we can install the LED and solder the minus pin to the ground pad on the PMS2. Next, we need to solder the red plus wire to the L plus pad on the PMS2 board. Then we can solder the yellow data wire to the A pad. This is what my LED installation looks like. Just to reiterate, the yellow wire soldered to the LED should have been soldered to the far left D1 pin and not the far right D0 pin that you see in the video. Next, it's time to wire up the interface board starting with the power and ground. Let's start by tinning all the pads. I'm gonna be using 30 gauge silicon wire to run the 3.3 volt wire from the interface board to the PMS2 board. The 3.3 volt pad is on the top side of the PMS2 board. Next, we need to run a 1.8 volt wire to the PMS2. The 1.8 volt pad is on the bottom edge of the PMS2. Finally, we need to run a ground wire to the PMS2 board. I use this ground pad on the bottom edge of the PMS2. And here's how my interface board power wiring looks. Now we need to run a wire from the interface board to the PMS2 for the power switch. I used another 30 gauge silicone wire and ran it through the same hole as the battery wires. I ran it under the LED legs and soldered it onto the pad marked BTN or button on the top of the PMS2 board. Now, since I'm using the RVL amp, I need to run the SCW and SDW wires from the RVL amp to the PMS2. I used a yellow 30 gauge wire for SDW and a blue wire for SCW. Next, again, because I'm using the RVL amp, I need to solder a wire from this volume pad on the interface board to this pad on the PMS2 board. If you're using the UAMP2 instead of the RVL amp, there's a jumper that you need to solder to enable volume control. Here's what my wiring looks like after soldering the SCW and SDW wires to the PMS2. There are a few sets of wires on the Ishida that need to be shielded, meaning the signal wires should be surrounded by a grounded shield. However, shielded wires are often thicker and stiffer than unshielded wires. Many modders specializing in portable Wii builds will use pairs of solid core wires wrapped around each other. This acts as an effective shielded wire where one wire is the signal and the other wire is the ground. I've got this 30 gauge wire wrapping wire in a few different colors, so let's go through the steps of how to wrap two wires together. Before I do that, I should warn you that you shouldn't use this 30 gauge wire wrapping wire at all. I go into more detail about this later, but using 34 gauge magnet wires makes wiring to the actual Wii itself easier. The only downside with that is I couldn't find 34 gauge magnet wire in a variety of colors. I can only find it in this clear color and a red color. Using more wire colors makes it easier to keep track of where all the wires are coming from, especially when we start soldering wires that get covered up before you end up soldering the other end. To wrap the wires together, you'll need something heavy to hook the wires onto. Take a long length of two different colors of wire. Then you need to tie them together and loop them around your heavy thing. Next, you'll need a drill. Place the other end of the wires into the chuck of the drill. Then all you need to do is pull the wires tight and use the drill to carefully twist the wires pretty tightly. I ended up making multiple different color combinations so that I could tell the wires apart when they were soldered in the case. 
Now that we have some wrapped wire, let's use some to finish wiring up the interface board. The L+, L-, R+, and R- vias are for the left and right speaker audio and ground. I tried to make some left and right colored wire wraps that match composite video cables, white for left, red for right, but I didn't have any black wire for the ground, so I used blue wire for the ground. There's also an S via that is for the start button signal, so I used a single yellow wire for that. Next, there are five vias toward the bottom of the interface board. I think these are mostly for connecting audio from the Wii, but I'm not 100% sure. Anyways, it was recommended to use wrapped wire for the MC signal, so I used a third color combination for that. Then I used single wires for the C, D, and WS vias. It's time to install the PMS PD board, and this is where things start to get a little crazy. Because this board will cover up some of the pads on the PMS2 that we need to solder wires to, we need to pre-solder a bunch of wires to the PMS2 first. Let's solder a wire to the T- pad, which we'll use for the thermistor later. For the PMS PD board itself, we need wires from the UP, PW, charge, ground, and 3.3 volt pads. We also need wires soldered to all of the voltage lines that go from the PMS2 to the Wii board. I'll label each wire as I solder it with the gauge wire that I used and where it eventually will be soldered to. Unfortunately, there are not enough pads for some of these wires, so I had to solder some wires on top of each other, such as these 3.3 volt wires. And this ground wire. Look at this absolute mess of wires. Okay, now we can secure the PMS PD board to the Ashita shell with the short silver Wii K screws. Now we can solder the wires from the PMS2 to the PMS PD. So first let's tin the pads. Then we can solder the ground wire, then the charge wire, then the small 3.3 volt wire, then the PW wire, and finally the UP wire. While we're here, we need to solder another set of wrapped wires for the USB port. Then we can plug in our SD to USB adapter with the SD card inserted into the port on the PMS PD. Next, we need to solder wires on top of the SCW and SDW pads. These SCW and SDW wires are I2C lines that allow the Wii to communicate with the PMS2. We also need to solder a wire to the headphone sense pad if you're using the RVL amp. And oops, I guess they lost footage of me soldering a blue wire to the U10 pad here on the PMS. We're almost ready to start soldering the wires to the trimmed Wii, but first we need to solder in this little RVL NTC board. This is a thermistor that keeps track of the temperature of the Wii board. There is a T- pad on this board that we will solder the black wire that we already soldered from the PMS2. 
We can pre-tin the T- pad while we're here. Now we can solder all the voltage wires that we already prepared to the Wii board. You want to position the Wii so that the wires are pretty short, but you also want to be able to lift the Wii board if you ever need to get to the boards underneath. While we're soldering these voltage wires, let's solder the black T- wire to that RVL MTC board. The PMS2 documentation recommends soldering two ground wires to the Wii, so one ground wire will go here. The other ground wire can go to any ground pad on the Wii. I just chose to use the screw pad which is also connected to ground. Before we remove the blue stickers from the heat sinks, let's just make sure that the Wii can fit flat on the heat sinks and that no wires are in the way. Now let's clean off the Wii CPU and GPU heat spreaders with some isopropyl alcohol. Then we can remove those blue stickers from the heat sinks and place the Wii board down on top. We won't be screwing it down for now, but the adhesive on the heat sinks will keep the Wii from sliding around. Okay, so I didn't do a good job of recording this part, but we need to start soldering the signal wires to the tiny vias on the Wii. I want to reiterate that I highly recommend using 34 gauge magnet wire instead of the 30 gauge wire that I used. The Wii vias are pretty small, so smaller wires are easier to solder to them. I also want to mention that you should not run these signal wires from the bottom of the Wii board as I did. I reached out to Gunner about issues I ran into later on in this video, and he recommended running these signal wires from the top of the Wii, like this picture here. Sorry for the confusion, but I'm just trying to save you some time. First up is the U10 wire coming from the PMS2 board. I'll put up a diagram of the via that this wire should connect to. Next up is the headphone sense wire. The four vias here are for the four audio wires that we soldered from the interface board earlier. I was running into problems tinning some of these vias, so you'll see me scrape the solder mask off of each via to expose the copper before I add solder to it. After I tin the vias, I like to clean the flux off with isopropyl alcohol. First up is the WS wire. Next is the D wire. Let's skip over the MC wire and solder the C wire. Now since we soldered a wrapped wire to MC and ground, we need to find a location to solder the ground wire to. In the video here you see me trying to use a multimeter to find a via that has continuity with the ground screw pad. I ended up finding one relatively close to the MC via, however I learned that even though wires may have continuity with ground, that doesn't make them acceptable to solder ground wires to. I eventually moved my ground wire to the ground screw pad circled here. So first, solder the MC wire to the MC via on the Wii but then it should ignore what I'm doing and solder the ground wire to that ground screw pad like we did with one of the ground wires from the PMS2. Next we need to solder the SCW and SDW wires to the Wii. Here's what all my wiring looks like at this stage, ignoring the ground wire for MC. At this point I wanted to test to see if the Wii would still boot, so I resoldered my Wii AV port as I did in my trimming video to see if I could get composite video output. I added one battery to the Ishida and booted the console, but I didn't get any composite video output. But I think this issue was caused by that MC ground wire being in the wrong spot. Anyways, let's move on to assembling all the components that go on the top shell of the Ishida. First is the IPS screen. Make sure that the dust protector tab is sticking out of the front of the shell so that you can take it off later. Then we need to add the 3D printed bracket that secures the screen to the shell. I sort of lied when I said I wouldn't need any other screws besides the Wii K screws. I ended up buying these M2 by 6mm coarse threaded screws from AliExpress and I used those to secure the screen bracket to the shell. Next we need to prepare the IPS screen driver board. As you can see there are a bunch of JST connectors on that board. We need to remove them so that the driver board will sit flush with the 3D printed bracket. First I added some fresh solder to all the pins. 
Then I used my desoldering gun to remove the solder on all the JST connectors. Even after removing those, the board still doesn't sit flush, so I used some side cutters to cut those other pins short. If you try to move on to putting the buttons and controller PCBs in place, you'll notice that the right controller PCB covers up most of the VGA pads on the LCD screen driver board, so we need to pre-wire the VGA lines before we go any further. On the bottom of the driver board, you will see labels of all the VGA signals. In this case, it goes blue, green, red, and then horizontal sync and vertical sync. So first, let's thin all these pads from the top side. I created a few more sets of twisted wires in different colors. I used a white wire for ground since it didn't have black. I chose to use yellow instead of green because I didn't have a green wire. For horizontal and vertical sync, we just need single wires. Now we can insert the flex cable from the IPS screen into the driver board and secure it with some more of those M2 by 6 millimeter screws. While we're here, we need to modify the driver board so that it can run off the 3.3 volt power that we can get from the PMS2. This involves bypassing the onboard voltage regulators, and that depends on which driver board you have. If you have the green one, you just need to lift this pin on this voltage regulator. Later on, we'll be soldering wires to supply power and ground to the driver board, but I decided to pre-tin the pads for now. Finally, bend the wires down out of the way. We'll be coming back to these speakers later, but for now, let's put them into their spots in the shell. I'm not exactly sure what happened to the shell model, but before we can install the C-stick board, we need to fix something. If you look closely, there is a little tab that sticks out of the shell that keeps the C-stick board from sitting flush. So we just need to take some side cutters and cut this little tab off. Pretty easy to do, but it's absolutely gut-wrenching on such a nice looking and expensive resin print. With that tab gone, the board can sit the way it's supposed to. Now we can put the face buttons and button membranes in place. But when I tried to put the right controller PCB in place, I noticed that the screws I used to secure the LCD panel bracket in place are too tall and it makes contact with the bottom of the controller PCB. So I took those screws out and the PCB seems to fit better. From the recommendations of users in the BitBuilt Discord, I replaced the screws I was using with these very short, fine threaded Wii screws. I'm kind of iffy on these screws because they're so fine pitched. I don't feel comfortable that they will hold very well over time, but that's the recommendation from the Discord. To protect the VGA lines from shorting on the controller board PCB, I put a piece of captain tape over the pads on the driver board. Before we can actually screw the right controller board down, we need to add the R button contact, which needs to be assembled. So first solder the wires on the back side of these contact boards. I know I'm soldering them to the front, but I later change them to the back. Then the contact board slips into this 3D printed bracket. Now we can attach them to the controller board with an M2 by 6 millimeter screw. I wanted to do a test fit of the board, and this is when I discovered that those black trigger bracket things are in the way of the controller board. At first I thought the wires coming from the front of the contact board were the issue, but it was the brackets themselves. Anyways, I soldered the wires on the back side and reattached them to the controller board. Then I soldered the contact wires to the vias on the controller board. It doesn't matter which wire goes where because all it needs to do is complete a circuit. Then I repeated the process for the left controller PCB. This is what both controller board PCBs look like after attaching the contact boards. Now again, when I tried to install the left controller PCB, I noticed that the springy legs on the speaker didn't make any contact with the PCB. This isn't a good thing because if they don't touch, then they literally aren't going to work. 
So another recommendation from the BitBuilt Discord was to solder wires directly from these contacts to the contacts on the PCB. So I tinned the legs, but while I was trying to solder a wire to one of the contacts, a speaker leg melted the plastic housing and just kind of flopped around. So I ended up cutting them short and soldered the wires to the cut legs. Then I soldered the other end to the contact on the controller PCB. Then I just tucked the wires in and got the button membrane ready again. But before I screwed it down, I got worried that the vias on the PCB might short out on the screw that holds the screen in place. So I put a piece of captain tape over them on the bottom side. Only after all of that was I able to screw the right controller PCB down. Then I added the D-pad and the left thumbstick to the stick box and screwed the left controller PCB down. You should solder the wires to the left side speaker now too. I ended up coming back later to do that. Then I installed the C-stick PCB. There aren't any screws that hold it in place. However, there are four wires that we need to install to connect the C-stick PCB to the right controller PCB. Again, I'm using 30 gauge silicone wire in different colors and matching the vias up by the labels on the silk screen. The last thing to do to the controller boards is to add the flex cable with the blue side facing up. Now begins the great combining of the two shell halves starting with the wires for the controller board here. First up is the 3.3 volt wire that we soldered to the PMS2 earlier. I just decided to use these vias as pads and solder the wire on top of the via. Next we need a ground wire. I decided to just add another ground wire coming from this screw pad here. Now we can wire up the 3.3 volts and ground from the LCD screen. I opted to solder these wires to the 3.3 volt and ground pads here on the GC Plus PCB. Next up are the speaker wires coming from the interface board. Just make sure that the speaker signal wires go to the plus pad and the ground wire goes to the minus pad. And now the start button wire gets soldered next to the speaker wires. One thing I wish I did earlier was solder the mode wire to 3.3 volts. That enables VGA output on the Wii. The reason I didn't was because I wanted to test the composite video, which gets disabled when you solder the mode wire. Anyways, solder a wire to this mode via on the Wii. Unfortunately, you'll probably have to remove some of the other wires out of the way temporarily. We need to solder to a 3.3 volt source, which the right side of this SMD resistor gives us. So solder the other side of the wire to the right side of that component. Now just move that wire up out of the way. Before I resolder these wires, I chose to solder a wire to the GameCube controller data via here. The other end of this wire goes to the other via we didn't solder to before on the controller board. Now we can resolder those wires, but before I did that, I cleaned everything with isopropyl alcohol. Remember, don't look at where my MC ground wire is going, yours should be in the screw via in the bottom right. Next up are the USB wires. We need to scrape the solder mask off here and pre-tin the vias. 
the D plus wire goes to the top via and the D minus wire goes to the bottom. Thankfully, some of the last soldering we have to do is to connect the VGA lines from the screen to the Wii. For each color, you'll have a signal via and a ground via. Scrape the solder mask off, tin the via, and then solder the wires. First up is the blue wire. The top via here is for the blue signal, the bottom is for the ground. Next is green. Remember I used yellow wire for the green. The left via is signal and the right is ground. Next is red. Left via is for signal and the right via is for ground. Lastly are the horizontal and vertical sync wires. Now these wires can be really difficult to solder because you have to solder directly to the video encoder chip, which is that big black chip near my fingers. I tried soldering the H-sync wire first since it comes first in line, but I found it was harder to solder the V-sync wire next to it without bridging the wires. So I restarted and soldered the V-sync wire first. Then it became easier to solder the H-sync since it's on the outside and you can solder it just by pressing up against the edge of the pins. This part would probably have been easier if I had used 34 gauge wire instead of 30. I made sure to test the wires for continuity since they are so close together and I didn't want any shorts. We can finally begin closing the Ishida up. Put the batteries in making sure that the positive side is to the top on both sides. Then we can screw the Wii board with some Wii screws. The little peg things on the Z button are not symmetrical. We need to trim the long side off of one of them in order to fit it properly on the left side of the shell, just so that it's about even with the other side. Then we can install the Z buttons into the shell. Make sure that there are no wires that might get crushed, and you can carefully place the top half of the Ashida onto the bottom half. After some messing around and getting everything to line up, I use some more of those M2 by 6 mm coarse thread screws to screw the case together. While I've been testing the Ishida for a few days, and for the most part there aren't really any issues, However, sometimes when I try to boot the Ishida, it doesn't seem like RV Loader is booting. It would basically just go to a black screen and it was almost like the console is not booting. I've been asking questions in both the BitBuilt Discord and I even reached out to Gunner, AKA G-Man Mod, who is somebody who builds Ishidas and portable Wiis. I don't really know for a living, but they, they sell them on Etsy. So they're actually a really good resource because they build and sell these portable Wiis for other people. I asked them for help with my issue, but I also just asked them if they had any tips tips for people trying to build their own Ashidas and other portable Wiis. Because of the way that I soldered my Ashida, having these wires come from the front of the actual trimmed Wii board makes it really difficult to work on this if there are any sort of troubleshooting issues. G-Man showed me a picture where all these wires that I have routed in the front of the Wii actually just get routed in the back of the Wii. So that way, if you ever have to open up your Ashida to work on anything, fix any wiring, which is probably gonna be the case if you're a first time builder, it's better to have all the wires coming from the same side, basically the top side of the Wii board, versus both the top and the bottom. So like I have these wires coming from the screen, the VGA wires on the side here, but then I have all these other ones coming from the bottom. So they recommend really just having all of the wiring come from the one side. That way if you ever have to work on it, you can just flip up the Wii board and get at the stuff underneath. G-Man said that the issues that I was having with RV loader booting are probably due to this USB wire here, which goes from the power delivery board here up to this bottom section on the Wii. This wire should be as short as possible just to guarantee a rock solid boot basically. However, I'm not really thrilled with the fact that I used 30 gauge wire. I think it kind of makes soldering to these vias harder. Most of the professionals that build portable Wiis for other people use 34 gauge uh, magnet wire essentially, which is even thinner than the 30 gauge wire that I used. So I think what I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna do it off camera and I'll kind of show you what I've, I've done afterwards. I'm gonna redo all of the wires that attach to the Wii board itself. So unfortunately that means basically all the VGA lines and all of these lines here 
that solder onto the Wii board itself. I'm gonna redo all that wiring and 34 gauge wiring. That might help my USB situation as well because with 34 gauge wire, you can wrap the wires with the drill even tighter than I could get with my 30 gauge wire. So I know that kind of messes with the continuity of my video here, but I wanna make sure that I'm giving you the best possible advice if you're gonna tackle this on your own. G-Man also wanted me to mention that you should never solder to the points on the Wii while the batteries are still in. The last thing that you wanna do when you put your portable together is put the batteries in. That's the very last thing you do. Otherwise, you might damage some of the boards, the PMS board, or even the Wii itself, or even yourself. Lithium ion batteries can be kind of dangerous, so please just avoid soldering to any parts inside of here with the lithium ion batteries inside still. So I'll be back with some new wiring and we'll see if I can get this Ashita to be stable. Okay, I'm back after redoing all the wiring with the 34 gauge wire. Now, I think this was a really good call because now you have the ability basically to pick up the Wii board and access everything underneath of here. I know the beginning of this video, I, I kind of soldered everything going up the front here. All the wiring points are gonna stay the same, except for what I did was basically solder all the wires facing up this way. So the, like U10, the headphone sense, and I just routed these um, audio wires up here and up and around. And I only had two different colors of this 34 gauge wire. So it makes it kind of difficult to differentiate which wire does what. Although one of the advantages to doing the wiring up around this way is that you can actually lift up the Wii and just read where, or look at where the wire is coming from. So that is a big advantage. I think it does make a big difference both in soldering to the Wii vias as well as being able to tell where a wire is coming from and the ability to take out the batteries when you need to do work inside of here. Before we can actually use our Ashita, we have to do some setup in RV Loader. The first time you use the power button on your Ashita, you're gonna have to turn it on and off again in order for the actual Ashita to boot up. We'll have to change a setting in RV Loader so that yours turns on by just sliding it to one side like mine is. If your Ashita is set up properly, then you will be greeted with the RV Loader screen. Maybe you've already got some games on there like I do, but we're not gonna do anything with games yet. We're gonna use the C stick until we get to this menu here, and we're going to select the cog wheel, which is gonna open up the settings menu. Before we actually do anything, we should test the controller buttons by going down to this controller menu and then going to the button tester. That way you can test if all of your buttons are working. The only thing that shouldn't work is this left C button. It doesn't really even seem to do anything. It doesn't register on the GameCube controller here, but all the other buttons and the start button down here should register on this controller tester. Then we press L and R to get out of this, and then B to get back over to the left here. We wanna make sure that all of our firmware is up to date. The GC Plus does have a firmware update option, but my GC Plus is pretty old and it already had the latest firmware. But if you did want to update the firmware, you go to this controller menu, click on this firmware update once you have the up-to-date GC Plus files. Now keep in mind that this is not Wi-Fi connected, so if you want to update any of the firmware, you'll have to go to the specific website, download the firmware file, and use the USB cable plugged into your computer to transfer the files over. So I think you shouldn't have to worry about updating the controller firmware, but we do want to update the power firmware. Basically that's the PMS2 firmware. There might be a separate firmware for the PMS Lite, but for me, I'm using a PMS2. So on the PMS2 website, we want to download the latest firmware, and then we can transfer it over to our Ashita using a USB cable connected to our computer. Then in the power menu here, we can go all the way to the bottom. Then we want to click on firmware update, then it will automatically update the firmware with the files that you copied over to the USB drive. Once you've updated all the firmware that you can, turn the console off and back on again, and then we can go through some of the other settings that you need to configure. I've already updated all the settings on my Ashita, but let's just go through all the menu options and I'll show you what I changed. There's nothing that I changed on this loader menu, so let's go to controller. Now I don't think I changed anything here. I think you might be able to go through the sticks wizard that might set the dead zone and endpoints and things for the control sticks. But what we do want to change is the trigger mode. I believe I had that set to, or by default that set to digital or something. I changed it to analog. Now under the power menu, let's go all the way back to the top. This RV loader menu is kind of generic. It's not set up for one specific Wii Portable. So we need to look up the exact battery specifications for our Ashita in order to change the power settings here. You can copy the settings that I'm using because I verify that this is what the Ashita should run at. So it has a 10,000 milliamp hour battery 
I changed the charging current to as high up as it goes. I didn't change anything with the termination current or the pre-charge current. Next, you can change the power button type. This is what I was talking about earlier. I think by default it's on momentary maybe, but you want it to be toggle. That way it will turn on and off just by pressing it once. Next, we wanna change the status LED type to addressable type D. That is for the addressable LED up here. It will tell you things like when it's charging and when the battery is full. I didn't really change anything manually in this fan settings. I did run this run calibration and that kind of did a PID tune of the fan. So that automatically sets some of these things here. Then we can save the config again. I think the only thing I changed in the audio menu was the volume control system. I changed it to potentiometer because we have a potentiometer um, control wheel at the bottom. Okay, that should be everything as far as configuration is concerned, but if we go to the status screen, it kind of helps you diagnose certain things. So in my case, I have the GC Plus 2, which was de uh, detected. I have the UAMP, which was detected. I have the PMS2 detected. Because I'm charging my Shida right now, it tells me that I'm charging. It tells me the current battery voltage, which mine is a little bit under 4,000 millivolts right now. And the last thing there is the battery current which is basically the load on the battery right now. And as you can see, I'm trying to charge it with this charging cable here and the milliamp draw here is negative, which means that as long as I'm plugged into this particular USB power delivery, my Ashida will not be able to charge faster than it will drain. It gets even worse if I try to unplug that USB cable. You can see the negative milliamps goes way up just because obviously I'm not charging anything. That is like the unplugged milliamp draw of the whole system with the screen and everything going. So unfortunately I don't have the proper USB power delivery power supply that I need for the Ishida. I've heard that 12 amp USB power delivery chargers are better, but those are a little bit more rare and mine is a 15 amp and it doesn't seem to be as compatible with the Ishida. So that's one of the biggest drawbacks about the Ishida. If you don't have the right power adapter, the Ashida will not be able to charge faster than it will drain, even if it's plugged in. Let's talk about loading games onto the Ashida. If you plug your Ashida into your computer with a USB cable, there are a couple of different folders. There's a GameCube folder, there's a WBFS folder, and then there's a VC or Virtual Console folder. If you add games to those different folders, they will automatically show up in your Ashida once you turn it back on again. Here we are back in the RV loader menu for GameCube games. Now, unfortunately, most GameCube games by default are four by three. So if you try to play them here, it would stretch them to widescreen. If you press B hovering over a game, it will open this menu of options that you can change. But I never really found like this did anything. But let's try it. Let's do force widescreen no. And let's see if it will get this Zelda game to open in four by three mode. You see the game is stretched to 16 by nine, even though I checked that option to not force widescreen. I know in the future, there's going to be Aurelio's direct drive board, which is another board that we'll have to add in here to give the Ashida the ability to edit the settings of the LCD screen. That way you can actually force it to four by three instead of 16 by nine. But as you can see, the Ashida plays GameCube games pretty well. Obviously it has a GameCube button layout and you don't really have to do any GameCube button mapping or anything to get the games to work. Now it's probably gonna annoy a lot of people that you can't easily switch from 16 by nine to four by three through the menu, but maybe with the direct drive board, it will be easier in the future. We can use the button combination L, R, Z, B, and down on the D-pad to go back to the RV loader menu. Now let's go over to the Wii option in the C-Stick menu. Now some Wii games will work out of the box with the Ishida because the Wii had a GameCube controller port. So essentially any games that worked with the GameCube controller will work with the Ishida without having to configure anything. But for example, Donkey Kong Country Returns was never compatible with GameCube controllers. So if we go into the B menu here, there is this GC2 Wiimote option. So we wanna enable that. Then we can configure the uh, Wiimote emulation, basically mapping a Wiimote to the Ashida's GameCube buttons. Obviously it's not perfect, but it's just a matter of tweaking your button layout so that you can play the game pretty well. You can also play virtual console games pretty easily, but unfortunately they're stuck in 16 by nine. Until we have Aurelio's direct drive board, there's really no way to configure that unless you want to manually change the settings uh, with some of the pinouts in the back of the LCD screen. I know this is a pretty long video already, but I just wanna give you my final thoughts. And I apologize for parts of this video where there isn't any audio. I bought a new microphone while I was working on this video and I couldn't quite figure it out in time to produce this whole video. So there are kind of parts with some bad audio or no audio at all. So hopefully you can see past that. I also wanted to mention that there were some things that I didn't do to my Ashida that I may do in the future, such as the MX chip 
The MX chip is really useful if you want to play games that use the real-time clock functionality, which is basically like Animal Crossing, so keeping track of the clock uh, in real time as you play those games. I'm not sure if Animal Crossing would be like unplayable without the MX chip, but the MX chip provides that real-time clock functionality. I also didn't reinstall the Bluetooth chip, which basically means that you won't be able to boot into the native Wii menu. Uh, it kind of locks you out if you don't have the Bluetooth chip, even if you don't intend to use Bluetooth controllers, for whatever reason, you can't access the Wii menu, the, the default Wii menu, not the RV letter menu, without the Bluetooth chip installed. It's also kind of unfair to judge the Ashida without Aurelio's direct drive board, which should give the Ashida the ability to change the aspect ratio of the screen between 4x3 and 16x9 without you having to do anything else, which is like a pretty big feature, especially since a lot of games don't work well with 16x9. They basically will stretch widescreen, which is pretty much awful. I did want to talk about some pros and cons, so let's get into that now. Let's start with the pros. I think the build is actually pretty straightforward once you know what to do. It took me a while to do all the research to actually figure out how to assemble everything together. But once I had everything going together, I figured out where everything needed to be. It wasn't really that difficult to get everything connected together. Another pro is that the four layer tech boards make the build a lot easier and a lot more logical as far as how to wire each different component up to each other. The four layer tech boards kind of guide you along the way as far as what needs to be soldered to what other component. The shell feels really nice in my hands. If you are a big fan of the GameCube controller, more specifically the Wavebird controller, then I think you're going to love the Ashida, how the Ashida feels in your hands. The IPS screen looks awesome. The colors look really nice. I think it's a must have if you're going to build an Ashida, if you're going to put all the time and effort and money into building one, I think you have to have that screen in your Ashida. The BitBuild community is really great. Not that that's a feature of the Ashida, but if you get stuck anywhere along your way, I think that there's a bunch of people who would be more than willing to help you along and diagnose your particular issues. And the last pro is the Ashida has given me the greatest sense of accomplishment of any mod that I've ever done. I don't know what it is about it. Maybe it just kind of seems so difficult on the outside. And when you're done, you have this really awesome, uh, pretty cohesive package that feels nice. It plays a lot of great games. Just something about that made me feel really special. It's hard to explain, but I think the Ashida is one of the most awesome mods that I've ever done. Now let's get into the cons of the Ashida. I think overall it's extremely expensive. I mean, for the price that I spent for all the parts individually, I could have bought a Steam Deck, actually probably like a Steam Deck and a half, and emulated all of the games that the Ashida plays. Don't get me wrong, I think the Ashida is special, but I just don't think it's worth all of the money that I spent trying to put it together. It sort of feels like an extremely expensive novelty. I mean, I don't necessarily normally play all the consoles that I mod anyways. That's pretty much what this cabinet behind me is. It's dedicated to just holding all the mods that I've modded. Not that I don't ever intend to play them, but I am just so busy working on videos that I don't often have time to spend and just sit and play video games. But with the Ashida, especially now that I'm finished with this video, I don't really have anything else to do with with it other than have it sit in the shelf. Maybe I'll do those other upgrades like the MX chip and the Wi-Fi chip and the Aurelio direct drive board. That's actually the next con too, is that the direct drive board is currently unavailable. I'm not sure if they already did a run of those direct drive boards, but I keep hearing that they're gonna be available soon and that is pretty much a necessity to use with the IPS, the 16 by nine IPS screen. Playing the four x three games stretched to 16 by nine is possible. And if it doesn't bother you, then that's great. But I think it definitely will bother a lot of people, especially for the amount of money that you spend doing this. It's not very simple to switch back and forth between 16 by nine and four x three. And speaking of parts availability, that's actually the next con. When I bought all the parts a few years ago, I pretty much had the pick of whatever I wanted. So I was able to get the PMS2 instead of the PMS Lite and some of the other things like the UAMP instead of the RVL amp or whatever it was, there were certain parts that they kind of come and go out of stock. And that was kind of because of the chip shortage and things, they were not all available at the same time. But going forward, I'm not sure if that's going to change either, having complete availability of all the parts at any given time, especially when you might watch this video in six months or a year from when I made it, I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to get all the parts that you need to build one. And the final, and what I think is the largest con is the poor documentation. Honestly, it's kind of insulting. I know that the Ashida is sort of a, I don't know, brainchild of a lot of different groups. We have four layer tech, 
the BitBuilt community, Wesk who did the case scan and the layout of where all the parts are supposed to go inside of it. So yes, I understand that it is uh, there were a lot of people involved. And I also understand that the Wii Portable community is sort of evolving over time, like best practices, best way to do the Wii trim to be able to go inside of the Ishida. But I think that if somebody is buying something like the Ishida, which has those PCBs, everything is pretty much known how it goes into the Ishida and where it's supposed to be routed to. Not having a document with step-by-step -step instructions and maybe some pictures is kind of annoying. Especially since the G-Boy did have a really detailed step-by-step -step instruction manual, I think there's no excuse for the Ishida to not have something like that. And that is pretty much the main reason I made this video. I just wanted to provide some documentation to the community for this relatively simple Wii Portable build. If you have any questions or comments about building an Ishida or your build in particular, feel free to leave them down below. I might not be the best person to answer them, but I'll try my hardest to connect you with somebody who might be able to answer them. And thanks again to PCBWay for providing the resin shells for this build. Without them, it wouldn't be possible. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.